That was a quick way to quiet a room. That's great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. And I'm really delighted tonight to be able to welcome Father Greg Boyle back to Holy Cross uh, and to welcome two of his homies, Brandon Washington and Saul Sanchez, to Holy Cross for the first time. I'm grateful to Father Jim Hayes, who's a Holy Cross chaplain, an alum, a member of the Jesuit community, and a good friend of Father Greg's who uh, encouraged him, welcomed him back to come to Holy Cross. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to, that we could all be together and that we're in person tonight. I also want to welcome our audience uh, watching via live stream to let our in-person and to let our in-person audience know that if you do ask a question, you may be recorded and on live stream for your grandma or something to see or your friends to see too. So maybe that's a good thing, right? Uh, there are many reasons why I admire Father Greg Boyle for his leadership in changing the lives of others as a founder or leader of a really major organization that fills a hugely important need. As a writer who helps readers understand others with great compassion and wisdom. As a public speaker who connects deeply with his audience as a man who befriends and sees possibility in people who others would really rather dismiss, and as a man who inspires young people to a hope-filled future. Father Gregory Boyle is a native of Los Angeles and a Jesuit priest. He's the founder of Homeboy Industries, the largest gang rehabil rehabilitation and reentry program in the world. The success of the program is credited to a radical approach he introduced some 30 years ago, to treat gang members as human beings. Father Greg, as he's called, or affectionately as Father G, or even G-Dog, served as pastor of Dolores Mission Church in Boyle Heights from 1986 to 1992. At the time, it was the poorest Catholic parish in Los Angeles that also had the highest concentration of gang activity in the city. He and members of the parish began working to help at-risk youth, starting an alternative school and daycare program, and finding jobs for former gang members. A few years later, they opened Homeboy Bakery as a training ground for former gang members to achieve gainful employment. And you think that's miraculous. I learned tonight he can't bake. So he did start a bakery, but he can't bake. Today, Homeboy Industries operates 10 social enterprise businesses and provides a variety of free wraparound services from legal assistance to mental health services, parenting classes, and tattoo removal to about 8,000 formerly gang-involved and previously incarcerated people each year. I've been fortunate enough to get a tour of Homeboy Industries a few years ago to learn firsthand and to see the really amazing scale of the work that they do in Los Angeles. Homeboy's flagship 18-month program is offered to over 450 individuals each year, and approximately two-thirds of Homeboy's senior staff are graduates of the program. I'll point out that the guy who introduced me used to work for Greg, was a Holy Cross alum who worked there for many years as well, so maybe there's some Holy Cross alum who will join them out there someday. Today, Homeboy serves as a model for programs around the globe with a worldwide network of more than 350 organizations that share Homeboy's commitment and approach to serving marginalized populations. Father Greg has received the California Peace Prize and been inducted in the California Hall of Fame. In 2014, the White House named him a Champion of Change. He received the University of Notre Dame's 2017 Laetare Medal, the oldest honor given to American Catholics, but Holy Cross beat them to the punch because in 2008, he received an honorary degree from the College of the Holy Cross. Currently, he serves as a committee member of, the California, of California Governor Gazim, Gavin Newsom's Economic and Job Recovery Task Force as a response to COVID-19. As you'll soon learn, Father Greg is a gifted and moving storyteller. 
His last appearance at Holy Cross in 2017 is our all-time most viewed talk on YouTube. He's also the author of best-selling books, including Tattoos on the Heart, published in 2010, which has been used in many Holy Cross classes. Give a shout out from the Holy Cross class. Is that what you guys are reading? There's one class here. Not that book? Okay. Barking, okay. Barking to the Choir, published in 2017. And The Whole Language, The Power of Extravagant Tenderness. Uh, there are books for sale in the Dunn Lounge afterwards, and Father Greg has agreed to stay and sign some after the talk as well. Father Greg always travels with homeboy trainees who share their own powerful stories. So today we're grateful to have with us uh, Brandon Washington and Saul so so Sanchez, as I mentioned. Uh, we look forward to hearing from them and from Father Greg. So welcome. How y'all doing? Good. My name is Brandon Washington, and um, I work at Homeboys Industries. I'm a, I work at a, at a bakery, and um, I used to be a drug addict. I used to um, do heroin. I used to um, smoke methamphetamine at a church, an abandoned church, and um, so I heard about Homeboys. So I went to Homeboys Industries. They helped me out with rehab. They helped me out. Um, care about my family because I didn't care about my mom, I didn't care about nobody, they didn't care about me, so why did I care about them? So um, I started going to rehab, I started doing all that stuff. I went to jail and um, I didn't care about going to jail, I would just go back and forth, coming out, go back in and see the homies that are in there, you know, it's like hanging out outside. It's like recess or nutrition, hanging out outside, but you're, you're inside all day, no sunlight, nothing like that, so I'm always, I'm always inside, I don't see no type of sun, nothing like that, so, um, Father G would go come visit in and um, Juvenile Hall and East Lake and um, County and stuff like that. So I came back out. Um, he helped me out with a job because I couldn't get a job because I have felony. I'm a felon and I have a strike, so there, there was no way I can get a job. So Father G helped me out by cleaning, doing maintenance, and um, he would just help me out. Um, my family, he'll come to my mom's house and say where is he at. I would be in the streets. I would be out there just getting high. I didn't care about nobody. So I finally just decided to get, come to the program and just get myself sober up. That way I can be something in life. And to this day, I'm, I should be done with my GED on April. So that's good. I'm trying to be a vet technician. So I, lo I love animals, you know. So, I mean, animals, they show love and they know what's going on. And I mean, that's what I'm gonna be, a vet technician. And thank you once again. I want to start by saying my story starts back when I was in fourth grade. Um, I remember my dad used to wake me up in the middle of the night, and he would wake me up just to go steal. Um, in those days, it was like um, like a lot of crime and a lot of like basically people didn't really have money where I lived at, so he used to take me to go steal the the stickers from behind the cars. I used to be his lookout, you know, like somebody uh, comes up, I'll honk, and he'll know, like, oh, just get up and walk away. So I didn't really know that was like a bad thing. It was more of like, like, you know, your dad tells you to do something, you do it. So that actually escalated to like, me staying in the car with the car on and him going inside somebody's backyard and like, stealing marijuana plants or a dog, you know, because things cost money. And then uh, after that, it started becoming a regular thing, which it was something of, a, of normal, you know? So growing up, all I really knew was like pain, misery, uh, emotional problems, like 
low self-esteem. Because when you're used to being told that you ain't really worth nothing, like truly in your heart, even though you're, you, you know what you do and you probably know a little bit of math or English, but you still feel like basically stupid. You know, and growing up, I always felt dumb, so I really didn't really care about anything. I ain't care about uh, education. I ain't care about my mom, especially not my dad, because he was a heroin addict. Uh, we used to we used to uh, have this thing uh, where like our bathroom could not have a lock, and it didn't even have a, a, a doorknob. We'll put a sock. We'll tie a sock both ways and put it in there. And the only reason why it was that because he was sometimes overdose, and the fire department will always keep breaking down that door. So we just came to an agreement where like. When you see the sock in the door, somebody's in there. And that was my first time knowing like what were really drugs did to you. So I remember seeing him like laying on the ground and with the needle in his arm and like, you know, blood and like sleep or whatever you call it, overdose and taking them and doing all those things. And it really never really felt bad. It actually felt like like, oh, you know, it happened again. But now that I really, that I'm starting getting older, uh, I kind of noticed that wasn't a thing to do. So it all comes down to like, growing up, my morals, my ethics, what I stand for, really wasn't in the right place. So ever since I was like in seventh grade or sixth grade, I've been going to jail, juvenile hall. I just currently served nine years in prison and I, I barely got out nine months ago. And Father G employed me already three times. I met Father G in the juvenile hall system on my first time. I remember I used to go and go see him, but not more of like the word or the preaching or like the bread or anything. It was more of like, I'm trying to get out my situation, my cell or my bunk or wherever, whatever I'm at just to stretch my legs or see somebody else, see, uh, uh, communicate. And he will always be kind and, and constantly tell you he loves you. And, 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 and that's kind of like foreign, you know, like if you're used to not being loved and somebody tells you they love you, you basically like in your mind, you're like, yeah, sure. I don't even love myself. So why would you love me? So, uh, just going throughout time, uh, he gave me a job, too, which I didn't really take that serious. It was more of like cleaning stuff down and helping out, and commitment was a problem for me, so I was more committed to using drugs myself. Um, I remember um, I started using drugs because my big brother told me one time smoke some of this, which it was weed, and I smoked it. But that weed became uh, another drug. That weed became mixing weed with alcohol. And then once the weed don't get you high, you'll be like, what's the next high? So, so when I was growing up, it was the 90s, and, and I remember I want to go buy some weed off my friend, and he told me he had something better. Turns out to be PCP. Uh, he would charge me $5 to dip a cigarette, swisher, uh, uh, weed, or whatever, $5. And actually that high lasted me a whole day. So it was convenient. I would smoke PCP almost every day. Once a day, obviously, because it would get me high for a few hours. But it, uh, I remember this day when we were smoking uh, PCP and we were in the back of the yard, my friend. And, and some guy happened to come and he was smoking with us and he passed out. And me being so young, cause I was barely like 13, 12 or probably 14, they didn't really know what to do. So, <clears throat> so I told my friend, like, hey, 
the boy, the homie, or whatever you want to call him, uh, passed out. And you know, the thing that hit me was he said, oh, just throw him over the gate in the back of the alley. And I was all like, for real? And he like, yeah. Would you want the cops to come in my house? And I was all like, you're right. So we did throw him over the gate. You know, it was something that was normal, you know, throw him over, you know. He happened to get up, yeah, eventually, you know, and left home, I, I guess, I don't know what happened, but that's the thing that since I was a kid, I always thought things were normal, like violence and drug using and throwing people over the gate, which is not, so as time went by, um, G will always call me though. He used to text me and tell him, tell me, come see me. And when I used to go, he would help me. He would give me money. He would tell me he loved me. He would tell me to stay. And I actually did for a little bit, just, just to see where it goes, but I wasn't really, t really ready, ready, ready to change. So this last time, you know, to serve me this sentence, um, I happened to, to take my brother's car and commit a crime, and the helicopter was watching his car. So when he jumped in, got inside the car, uh, the SWAT team moved in on him, and. He happened to do time, uh, like basically five years for me for nothing. And my family would tell me all the time, how come you don't, you don't tell him the truth? How come you don't tell him that it was you? Why are you gonna have your brother uh, basically go to jail for you? And me being me and thinking uh, that the code on the streets applies to anybody, anybody, no matter if it's family, I wasn't willing to do that. So, because of me, his family fell apart, obviously. You know, he, he, he wasn't there for his son, because he barely had one. Uh, because of me, uh, me and him don't really talk. Uh, because of me, my family broke apart. And Father G has been a big pillar in my life. You know, to be honest, like, nothing's free in life and nobody will give you anything unless you give them something in return. That's just how life works where I live or how I was raised. And he has gave me a lot of things that basically feel like, like given. And I still feel like I own sometimes. And I tell him like, damn, like there'll be situations where I'm in need and I don't know how does he know like that I need something, and he'll call, he'll tell me like, "Are you all right?" And I'll be like, "Damn, G, I'm embarrassed to ask you for things because you had gave me so much." But he always like basically sticks to what he believes on, and I feel like he believes he really truly believes on helping people out, no matter who you are or what you stand for, as long as you're willing to change. And right now I'm. I'm trying to change. I'm not perfect. I still think negative. I still suffer low self-esteem. I still like have anxiety. Till this day, I can't even go in the store alone. He knows. I always take my sister. So my sister's more like uh, my my uh, support. And, and she knows like, for example, like if I gotta do something, I ask her ahead of time, like, hey, can you take me uh, to Ross, to the market? And she she always tells me, like, why don't you go alone? And because I feel like, like, like people are out there to get me, or like, I'm gonna run into the wrong person, or the cops, or the way I look, or. A lot of things cross through my head, like in general, like anywhere. And Jesus is helping me out, like basically recover. 
You know, right now I'm currently uh, working for him again, third time. And he has basically like changed my life a lot. I would say he's like my father. I would say he, he doesn't give up. And I know I have let him down before. And I feel like, like I'm very blessed to know a guy like that. Just for him to start Homeboy Industry means a lot to people in LA, Compton, Watts, anywhere in California. Everybody knows about Homeboys. I walk around with my shirt and people honk. Not because they want to tell you where you're from or like what you got in your pocket or give me your chain. More of, that's a great guy. I know him. Or more like, you know, He's doing great things right here. And I'm very glad that he's basically part of me. And well, all I would like to say is like, even though you look perfect, normal, smart, that doesn't mean you're, you're not suffering something inside. With that said, I would like to introduce Father G. Thank you very much. Hard to tell if you look perfect because you got all the masks on, so it's, uh, thank you. Brandon, and thank you, Saul, and it's been great to travel with you. We just came from D.C. And the day will never come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than you two. And, uh, and we've had a good time. We've been on the road for a long time. Um, thank you for selling my book. Uh, I'm happy to sign afterwards. You know, uh, it's my third book, so I, I, uh, you know, I, I just don't want it to be you know, Godfather Three. You know, that's kind of the. Uh, and I just don't want it to suck. You know, like Godfather, Godfather Three. You know, we were flying uh, from L.A. to D.C. on Friday, and um, I was uh, walking to uh, back to my seat from the restroom, and I saw this tray table down, and I caught the the cover is kind of turquoise of the of my book and I went, oh my God, somebody's reading my book, you know, and, and it was open on the trade table and I turned to look to see who it was and <clears throat> the guy was totally drooling and snoring and babas and you know, like this I thought, so I'm doing my part to, to address insomnia apparently, so. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, it's good to be at Holy Cross, you know, uh, what Martin Luther King says about church could well be said of your time here at Holy Cross. It's not the place you've come to. It is the place you go from. And you go from here to do something very specific. And uh, even if you don't know what your future holds, it's still a very specific thing, which is to create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. And, and you do that in, with a particularity that stands uh, at the edges of things, as Pope Francis uh, would encourage us, you stand uh, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, and you stand with those whose dignity has been denied, and you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Um, you know, you hear Brandon and Saul, and you, you say, yeah, I personally listen to them and I say to myself, I've never had to carry what either of them has had to carry. I would not have survived a single day of their childhoods. So you stand there in awe at what they've had to carry rather than in judgment. And you stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away where you stand matters, and you brace yourself because uh, folks will 
accuse you of wasting your time at the margins. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You stand at the margins and other voices get heard. Doing that, of course, doesn't make any sense unless uh, we are anchored in a God that sustains us, a God who loves us without measure and without regret. And sure, it's true enough to say that uh, we're created in the image and likeness of God. Richard Rohr says, our image of God creates us, which is equally true. So you, you want to uh, make sure that that the God we believe in, the actual God we have, is spacious and expansive. Uh, my friend Mirabai Starr, who's a mystic and writes about mystics, she, she says, once you know the God of love, you fire all the other gods, which of course is sort of the task. And so you want to find uh, uh, this God who is spacious and expansive in love and too busy loving us to be judging us. All of us believe in a God of second chances, though you know society gives very few of them, and all of us believe in a God of infinite mercy, though we're kind of stingy when that comes. And all of us uh, believe in the God who is inclusion when uh, we want to cut people off and sever belonging. So our task is to create a community of kinship that you may be one, as Jesus says. And, and that's the whole idea. It's about connecting with each other. Uh, we were just in DC for this Ignatian uh, Solidarity Network uh, gathering. And, and so they saw, uh, you know, we got perilously close to the White, White House and, and uh, to, um, you know, the Washington Monument and all those things. A place that we weren't able to get into was the Holocaust Museum. In a number of years, I would uh, had two homies with me, and it was easier to get in there without booking a ticket beforehand. And so I brought Lewis and Joe. And um, I had been there many, many times, and had taken homies and homegirls there. And I said, go, go, you know, take your time. So like four hours later, they came back. I was waiting for them in the lobby. And we were debriefing, and if you've never been there, it's quite an amazing experience. And, and as we were standing there in the lobby, we could see over uh, at, at some distance in the lobby was a, a man in his 80s sitting behind a desk, and he was uh, reading. And at the front of the desk was a little sign that said, Holocaust Survivor. And there was a chair in front of the desk that seemed to invite you to sit in it. And uh, so we saw all that. And Joe said, well, what would we say to somebody who had suffered so much? And Lewis, because he was fearless, says, well, I'm going to go sit down and talk to him. And we said, you do that. We'll be in the bookstore. you know." And, <laughs> and so he did. And he told us about it later. The guy's name was Jacob. And uh, he was in his 80s. And he had been a teenager when he was in Auschwitz, his parents were killed there and his three sisters were gunned down right before his eyes. And he told his story to Lewis and Lewis listened to him with great attention. And when Jacob had finished telling his story, Lewis pulled out his card from, from his pocket and he said, my name is Lewis and, I, and I'm a gang member and I work at Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program in the world. I hope that if you're ever in LA, you'll come and see us. And Jacob studies the card. And then Lewis says, you know, I'm 35 years old. Half of my life, I've been locked up. And Jacob sort of scoffs a little. He says, yeah, American prisons, you, know, you get your own room and you have a bed and you have a pillow. We slept on wooden planks. If you said one word, they pulled you out of line and nearly beat you half to death. And Lewis really listened. 
And then Lewis said, yeah, I was beaten a gang of times at county jail. Once they beat me so badly, I, afterwards I looked like the elephant man, and they threw me naked in a cell, and I slept on a metal sheet. Well, it was at that point that I, I kind of um, interrupt him a little bit, and I said, uh, Lewis, let me see if I got this right. You were comparing your experience to a Holocaust survivor. And I'll never forget how clear-eyed he was and quick and certain, like the clarity of the gospel. He said, no, I wasn't comparing. And then he started to get emotional. He says, I wasn't competing with him. I was connecting with him. And that's the whole law and the prophets. That's the only thing we're asked to do. The God of love wants us to connect. The poet Wallace Stevens says, we live in the description of the place and not the place itself. So we need to not settle for the description of the place. We need to hold out for the place itself, where there is no us and them, where we obliterate the illusion that we are separate. We want to be able to really see people and really listen, as Lewis did to Jacob. The Buddhists say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. You want to be able to see people. Otherwise, you won't be able to get to the place where you actually love them. The homies at Homeboy Industries say, we're used to being watched. We're not used to being seen. And it's like Jesus with the Gerasene demoniac. I was praying over this the other day, and there are like three versions of it in the gospel. And one of them, Jesus says, what is your name? to the guy who's naked and on the road and nobody goes that way because they're afraid of him. What is your name? And he says, I'm legion, which means a lot. There are a lot of us, I guess. But I read a translation the other day that said what he meant was, I am what I am afflicted with. And that's how Folks at the margins sometimes identify, I am what I'm afflicted with. And sometimes all it needs is somebody to say, what is your name? And to see you instead of watch you. And to reflect back to you who you are. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And that's the key. You want to reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that keep people from seeing their truth, that they are exactly what God had in mind when God made them. You want to reach in and replace the messages that reinforce that you are what you are afflicted with. In the Acts of the Apostles, they have this odd uh, saying where it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. And it suggests that the measure of health in any community at all, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what people have to carry rather than in judgment. Marcus Borg says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. And this is not about us fixing people or changing people, or rescuing people, or even transforming people. It's about choosing to cherish, and that if it's true that the traumatized will find their way likely to causing trauma, it's equally true that the cherished will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and other people. So a number of years ago, I was invited to speak uh, at, in Richmond, Virginia at a, uh, a gang in-service, they call them, for 600 social workers. And it's, you know, I'd been at a lot of these in the past, and you know, they commandeer a hotel ballroom and 
and you sign in and you get credits. And they have workshops and breakout sessions and keynotes about gangs so that social workers understand kind of the dynamic of gangs. And so um, I had done this a lot of times and I figured I was gonna go and do a keynote or something. So I said yes to this invitation to go to Richmond, Virginia, and I bought my ticket. Well, oh, a week before I was to fly, I pull out the original invitation letter and to my horror, I discovered that I was to be the only speaker all damn day, nine to five. And I remember saying what the homies often say, oh, hell no, I'm not gonna be the only speaker. So, so I invited two homies just like uh, Brandon and Saul and Andre and Jose. And in their 18-month training program, like these guys, they were like in their ninth month. And um, so I sit them down and I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers and tell your stories. Take your time, because uh, we got a long ass day to fill, you know. And, and I had never heard their stories, and Jose gets up first, and I guess at the time he was like 25 years old, and um, been to prison, tattooed, gang member, but uh, at that juncture in his ninth month with us, he had become quite a valued member of our substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery, and now he's helping younger homies and homegirls with their addiction issues. So not only had he been to prison and was a gang member, he also had a long stretch as a heroin addict and an even longer stretch as a homeless man. So he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I, I think I was six when my mom looked at me and said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasped. And then he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish, he said to them. And we got whiplash going from gasp to laugh. But then he continued, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. And she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door. And she says to the guy who comes to the door, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school each day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. and Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion. And he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he regained his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded? if I don't welcome my own wounds. And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. 
For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. And in the end, the only thing that matters is to take seriously what Jesus took seriously. And they happen to be only four things. They're big things, but only four. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. And that's it. And like Jesus, the central feature of his ministry was that he was anchored in the God of love, and so he fired all the other gods. And he took seriously the covenant that said, as I have loved you, God says to us, so must you have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and stranger. And Jesus identifies these folks as those who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered in this particular way, God thinks they are trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship that God would recognize. It's about seeing as mystics do, to see the whole person. The homies always say, you know, you gotta, you gotta find the thorn underneath, which is what mystics do for a living. They don't really get sin and evil. No mystic is, spends much time there, eventually. Even Ignatius was, very scrupulous until he wasn't, and that's just because he got to know the God of love. Find me a mystic who believes in hell, and I will think you have not located a mystic. It's a way of seeing, seeing the whole person, so that you can say, what is your name? I was in my office, and uh, my office is glass enclosed, and uh, I can look out into the reception area. And this particular day, we were packed, as always, standing room only, every seat filled. And there were three uh, of our trainees, two homies and one homegirl, and they were sitting behind the counter, which we call the well. And people come in and sign in for tattoo removal or whatever, or to see me or to see a job developer. And I'm looking out and I have three donors, potential donors, sitting in front of me so I can look over their head and I see this guy com comes in and he's a gang member, but I don't know who he is, but he's obviously a gang member. And I can see the horror on the face of the three behind the counter because he has a soda can and with every gesture he's punctuating his conversation and a big glob of soda falls onto the counter. You know what? exclamation point here and a semicolon there. And I know right away that this is a, a combo burger of meth and madness. So I know I'm gonna have to get up and intervene so I, I stand. But before I can leave, Miguel Lugo, who's the head of security, is, shows up. He's the biggest vato who's ever worked at Homeboy, just huge big security on his back. All the security guards at Homeboy, and they're plentiful, are all gang members. And he spent, I think, 25 years in prison. Most of that time was in solitary confinement. And he ventilates the world with tenderness. It is his practice to cherish with every breath. And we have kind of a policy if somebody's erratic like this guy, that you take him outside, get him outside so that if he gets even more erratic, he won't trigger all the people who are easily triggered. So I watch him walk him outside, and later he tells me about it, and he, and he looks at the guy, and he asks his name, and he says, how about you and me? We walk down to Alvera Street, I'll buy you some tacos. And the guy lifts his shirt, 
revealing a gun tucked into the front. He said, how about I put a bullet in your head? And he lets the shirt drop. And Miguel looks at him, and he sees him, and he says, two tacos or three? And they proceed to walk down to Alvera Street. And, and Miguel says, the guy is having a conversation with the voices in his head. And, uh, but they're not staying in his head. They're leaping out of his mouth like big old frogs. Shoot his ass. You can't, he goes, no, he's all right. You can't trust him. He's buying me tacos like this back and forth all the way to Alvera Street. And so he gets to Alvera Street and he buys the guy three tacos. And the guy takes one taco and throws it to the ground. Obviously, the voices in his head told him to do that. But he consumed the other two tacos because he was hungry. And Miguel could see him and saw the thorn underneath and knew that all of us are born into the world wanting the same things. We're human beings. We all happen to have the same last name, beings. And he saw as God saw. And he saw this guy who thought he was the thing he was afflicted with. Oh, nobly born. Remember who you really are. Holy Cross is not the place you've come to. It's the place you go from. So you don't settle for the description of the place. You hold out for the place itself. I flew up to Sacramento to speak at Jesuit High, our high school in Sacramento, and, uh, and it was a Sunday evening, a little bit later start than I would like because I had a later mass. And, and so I had two guys with me, Rob and Chamuco, and Chamuco is a uh, kind of a affectionate name for the devil because Chamuco, along with lots of tattoos on his face, has two very pronounced black devil's horns tattooed on his forehead. So Chamuco and Rob and I are waiting for the shuttle bus to take us to the um, rental car place. And we get on the bus, and Rob and I sit across from each other like at midpoint. But for some reason, Chamuco goes all the way to the back of the bus and sits at the very back, back row. And people, I watch people come on the bus, and they, uh, they go to the back, and then they see Chamuco, and they say, hell no, and they go sit somewhere else. And they, I watch them do this foxtrot of avoiding sitting next to him until finally there are only two seats left. And he plunks himself down on either side. And they're not one bit happy that they have to sit next to this guy. And then we go to the rental car place and it's secluded and wooded and it was dark when suddenly the electric vehicle we're in conks out somewhere in the middle. and. And we can hear the woman driver turning the key. And she, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working on it. For some reason, it seemed odd to me. Everybody was silent. And there we are in wooded, dark seclusion. And a lone voice from the back of the bus says, I saw this in a movie once. <laughs> it does not end well. <laughs> well, the whole bus exploded in laughter. And it was quite sustained with the homies at Homeboy Industries called laughing from the stomach. And I am certain that exactly half of the bus voted a certain way in 2016, and the other half voted another way. But the place itself, this kinship of connection of repair of our severed belonging came to us by way of a guy with big ass devil's horns. The great John Lewis said, we all live in the same house. He doesn't qualify it and say, well, you know, some live on the third floor, some live in the basement. Nope. 
He doesn't make it aspirational. One day we may all live in the same house. It's declarative. We all live in the same house. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? But what he really means is, how do you say it? And Miguel Lugo shows you how you say it. You go from this place, and how you say it matters. One last a story, and then I'm going to invite uh, Brandon and Saul up here. And we will sit at a distance from each other and uh, answer your questions. You know, homies always say, uh, you know, they want a job at Homeboy. And I'll, in the old days, I'd say, yeah, I got an opening in the bakery, but you got to work with X, Y, and Z. And I rattle off the names of enemies, rivals. And they always say the same thing. I'll work with them, but I'm not going to talk to them which used to bother me in the old days until you discover that human beings can't demonize people they know. Humans, who share the same last name with each other, can't sustain that. So I had a homie uh, we all called Youngster. He was 19 years old from a certain neighborhood. And he, I thought he was ready. So I brought him to Homeboy Silkscreen, which is uh, a, a one of our 10 social enterprises that's been around for 27 years, and, uh, and I introduced him to all the workers there, and at that time we had like 30, and I watched him shake hands with every single one, firm handshake, and he looked at folks in the eye, and I thought, wow, this is great. Half of those guys were enemies and rivals, until finally he gets to the last guy, a guy named Puppet, who seemed to be wanting to avoid this encounter altogether. And when they were in each other's vicinity, they mumbled something, and they stared at their shoes, and they didn't shake hands. Well, I kn knew they were enemies, because I know what gangs they're from, but he just shook hands with a whole bunch of enemies. And so I discovered later that this was a hatred that was really quite personal, beyond which neither of them thought they could get past. So I sensed that much at the moment. I said, hey, you know, if you can't hang working with each other, let me know. I got a gang of people who want this job. Calladitos, they didn't say a word. Well, six months later, Puppet leaves his home to go to a corner store some distance from his house, and he purchases something. But on the way home, he, I don't know, decides to take a shortcut, and he dodges into an alley. And because he took this detour, suddenly, quite unexpectedly, he's surrounded by 10 members of a rival gang, 10 against one, and they beat him badly. And he falls to the ground, and while he's lying on the ground, they will not stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. And somebody finds his body and takes him to White Memorial Hospital, where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there, as in most places, to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so that the doctors can get two full days of a flat read. And then they can sign the death certificate. At the end of the two days, I went in and I anointed him with oil, his forehead. I said a blessing prayer. We disconnected. And a week later, I buried him. But in the first 24 hours, while Puppet was lying in his hospital bed, beaten, I was in my office alone, and the phone rings at 8 o'clock at night. And uh, it's youngster, Puppet's coworker from the silkscreen factory. And he said, hey, it's, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. And I told youngster, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he said, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fell silent under the weight of it. If 
Finally, he broke the silence, choking back his tears, and he said with great deliberation, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens? Yeah. Any exceptions? No. And once we know that we're all born into the world wanting the same thing, we connect. We ought not to settle for the description of the place when we could hold out for the place itself, a place where we see as God sees, where there is no us and them, there's just us where there is no daylight that separates us because separation is an illusion. Holy Cross is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And it is the place where you cease to care if anyone ever accuses you of wasting your time at the margins. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you very much. their microphone set up and everybody is, I know we're broadcasting to the world, but um, there are actually not that many people here. So if you just did this, I went like that. Otherwise, if, if it requires somebody to stand up and go to a microphone, if that's uh, the degree of difficulty is higher. So just uh, raise your hand and, and I'll repeat the question and pull your mask down as you say the question and I'll direct it to one of... Uh, my brothers or myself or not. You don't have to get up. You don't have to walk. You don't have to, all you have to do is go like that. Yes. Thank you, brave soul. Go ahead. Yeah, so the question is about staying motivated, and thank you for reading my book. Um, well, you know, I think part of the thing is to be anchored in the present moment and delighting in the person who's in front of you. I mean, I was telling you these two that this has been such an enjoyable trip, and it's, you know, a lot of flights and a lot of talks and a lot of places, and, and they're a delight to be with. You know, we, we're staying in Boston and driving here uh, this evening and it's just you enjoy each other when you when you pay attention and when you're anchored in the present moment people aren't selfish but people are self-absorbed and this is why people aren't happy but the minute you can kind of uh, find yourself attentive to somebody other than yourself then it's uh, that's what keeps you going. There's no magic formula to it except um, it's a practice. You have to work at it. And the homies ha are good at this. They do it with each other. They do it with me. They see you and they're attentive to you. So they're always reminding me to my own practice. Uh, a homie emailed me the other day and he said, uh, God breathes for me when I have forgotten how. And first of all, not bad, you know. But also, it's what we're supposed to do with each other, that we breathe for each other when the other person has forgotten how. And, uh, 
And Jesus doesn't invite us to that because it's grim duty. But Jesus knows that's where the joy is. And, and that is where the joy is. No matter what you ask next, I'm throwing it to them. Yes, thank you. impacted us pretty good. I mean, I love being on stage, seeing you guys, and I'm um, really great to be here. And my first time being in a big old crowd like this and Prodigy taking me in flights and going across the country and flying and traveling, it's pretty nice. To be realistic, um, I do believe in love now, but still, like, I have doubts, you know, like, like love in a way is, it could, it could actually hurt you, you know, when you love something, when you love somebody, and they let you down, and, and that's more of like a, like a defense mechanism when you don't let no love come your way so you wouldn't have to show love to nobody. Uh, but I do feel love now, especially from Father G. But I still struggle like myself, like to take love from a stranger or from anybody else. But he has changed my life and I know there is love in in the world at least, knowing him. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, this question goes to all of you, but what is the one thing that you would hope every person can take away What was the what would be the one thing that uh, the th many well the three of us would hope that someone would take away from this evening? Uh, I think I think that like just getting to know other people' experiences and getting to hear like like G. Myself, the homie, just talk about life itself and what we endure and the times that we felt like, like basically whoever's upstairs was going against you and the person downstairs was with you. Uh, I would like for people to actually take home uh, just a clear little idea of like what people go through and what to endure. I mean, I never felt love, so I mean, the only way I have love is through Father and we talk about the situations I go through and I've gone through a lot and Homeboy as well. So I mean, seeing you guys and me answering you guys' questions, feel that I'm like I feel in love and it's getting together, stuff like that. I, you know, I think at the moment we we um, we settle for a lot of things, and like moral outrage is is one thing, you know, and and we need to hold out for moral compass. So we think that we're called to shake our fist. 
but we're really called, invited to roll up our sleeves, you know. Or we think that we're called to uh, point things out, but we're really invited to point the way. And, and a lot of what happens in our country at the moment is that we get stuck in moral outrage. And moral outrage, if I'm morally outraged, it's only about me. And it's self-congratulatory, and it's only about me. But if you hold out for moral compass, then you insist that it be about us. And, and this is difficult because we get stuck in moral outrage. So we see a man attack an aged Asian woman on the streets of San Francisco, and we get stuck in moral outrage, and we're horrified. And, uh, and we wear t-shirts that say, love, not hate. And it's about us, or it's about me. It's about my outrage. But then if you kind of go, in the history of the world, nobody healthy, whole, well, integrated, in the history of the world has ever done such a thing. Ever. And then you, that's what the homies have taught me. Then you find the thorn underneath. Nobody at Homeboy Industries gets tripped up by behavior. They always know that behavior is a language. What language is that action speaking? Gang members have taught that too. That you don't get tripped up by behavior and you don't get stuck in moral outrage. You move quickly to moral compass that says all of us are unshakably good we all belong to each other. And now let's roll up our sleeves and point the way to repairing severed belonging. And the homies have taught me that. And I think it's a valuable lesson for our country at the moment. And I don't even know what question elicited that particular rant, but, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Maybe just, a, maybe just one more, because we got to drive back to Boston. One more. Yes, thank you. Excellent question. The question is about uh, where perhaps folks at Homeboy had the experience of being watched but not seen. How do you see people so that they're not just watched? Uh, you know, you know what's funny? Today I actually experienced that. Uh, I was going to the store and there was this guy with one leg on a wheelchair. And the guy, he he was saying something about today's my birthday. And people would like like hit the sidewalk and like walk around him. And I pass by, but when I see that guy, I actually see myself. Not literally the physical missing a, a leg, but more of like emotionally, spiritually, uh, what he has been through. And I go inside the store and I buy whatever, and, and I hate quarters. So I happen to give him all my quarters in my pocket. And he's like, oh, thank you. Uh, today's my birthday, uh, you know, and he started ranting off on his struggles, you know, how he lost his leg. And, and you know, one thing that caught my attention was like, or actually, I realized, I was I like, you know what? And he was like, what? And he, I'm like, I only know people like you. You and me are exactly the same. And he looked at me, and he was I like, like, oh, this was high, or something. <laughs> you know, and, and I actually told him, like, you know, I'm originally from South LA. Homelessness is a thing over there, you know? like." Right, right in the corner of my house, they have a tent. 
you know, people don't walk around them. Actually, people walk straight through them, and you know, you get to know them. You 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 ain't ate the food. You give them your food. You know, and I told them like, hey, you know what? Like, I feel more comfortable being around you. And he was like, why is that? And I was like, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm a gang member. And he looked at me, and he was like, I kind of had a feeling something was going on with you because of your walk. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, a lot of people tell me that. Uh, remember my little niece told me, uncle, why do you walk like a tarantula? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean a tarantula? And he's like, yeah, it's like, you take up all this space when you walk and, <laughs> and you're just walking. Hey man, that's like the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> For real. But, yeah, I just wanna, I just wanna let y'all know that we're just exactly the same. And that's why, like, I carry myself as, as an equal to anybody in general. Like, if you're rock bottom or you're in the top, that's about it. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming here tonight. <laughs>